And now to another story from Syria, one of inhuman suffering and near superhuman perseverance. A warning before we go any further, the account you're about to hear may upset many viewers. It's been eight years since the uprising against Bashar al-Assad began. The brutal war that followed has killed hundreds of thousands, forced millions from their homes, and led to the imprisonment, torture, and murder by Assad's regime of thousands more. Now, even as the Syrian leader secures his gains, international efforts at accountability are beginning. Many hope those could one day lead to justice. From Oslo, special correspondent Malcolm Brabant reports. At a time of extensive indifference to Syria, Omar al shogre strives to energize outrage at the bestiality perpetrated by President Bashar al-Assad's regime. For the first time, I was protesting because it was fun. But then I get arrested and I get tortured for two days and I lost my nails and they shocked me with electricity. al shogre was in Oslo to attend a human rights film festival. Before his appearance, he told me how torturers repeatedly sought to extract confessions for a crime he hadn't committed. How many of ears have you killed? No one. They come torture me with electricity. <laughs> like that. And you can't continue. Then you say, okay, I killed one. So you start to take out my nail. Oh, I've hit you again. And say, look, you should look. Oh, your nail is oh, I didn't kill anyone. Then I say, okay, we move to the next one. And she go, oh, oh, look, I killed, 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 I killed. Okay, how many have you killed? One. Oh, continue. Oh, two. Continue. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When I say ten, he was satisfied at that time. After first being imprisoned at the age of 15, al shogre ended up in a mountaintop compound north of Damascus. Its name, Sadnaya, the pinnacle of Syria's industrialized sadism. They said, we taught you 10 belts. If you silent, it's only 10. If you just scream one time, we're going to continue until you die. So when I get the first belt, I could not control myself. So I said, oh! And uh, just the belts, it's like if it's a rainy day, it's what the belts just coming, coming, and people hitting me, and the, like metal and the electricity, and the, the, like without stop, it's just getting hurt of everything. We call it the welcome party when you come to New Prison. Sadnaya is perhaps equivalent to a death camp because people are coming there to be executed or starved to death. Now we're going into the, the vehicle, the truck that brought those. Um, prisoners onto the site. Professor Ayal Weisman is a forensic architect. He led a team who worked with other survivors of Sadnaya to build virtual images of the prison to trigger memories and testimony that may one day be used by a prosecutor. It is really the last station that you would pass through uh, when after you've been arrested by the Syrian government forces. Uh, it is absolutely hell on earth. Weizmann sees comparisons between Assad's methods and the Holocaust. There's a banality of that evil, which is the kind of management of life and death, the management of reduction of bodies to bare bones, to put people in a threshold between life and death, a kind of calculated way of slow killing if you're not executed outright. Amid a litany of depravity, one of the most gruesome allegations is of summary executions before naked inmates were given their only meal of the day. Every day they kill more than two or three people in every room, but the only that it's not the torture hours when they get when you get your food in. It's just good morning, and the head of this dead body should be over the food, so the blood comes in. So you can't eat any day without the blood in your food. So you get in the body, you should put the head on the foot. If you don't, you get torture. al shogre's powers of recall captivated the Norwegian audience and fellow panel members like Gerald Fogford of Amnesty International. I believe it's uh, very credible because uh, it's the same story Amnesty International's researchers have heard uh, many times from, from both survivors but also from prison guards. We have also been in contact with some of the people who actually worked, including some of the people carrying out torture, and they're all telling the same story. Former prisoners told the forensic architects that they were forced to communicate by whispers. 
Al Shogre tells a similar story. It was uh, the university of whispers because we were not allowed to speak in prison. The person next to me was a doctor. To the other side, psychologist. In front of me, an engineer. Behind me, a lawyer. He died, we get a teacher. He died, we get economics. The doctor is sharing knowledge how to take care of our uh, wounds and the psychologist how to be happy in prison. Al Shogre says his fellow inmates provided him with the mental fortitude to survive. It was like torture, physical and psychological torture, sexual torture, a lot of dead people. Some people were killed by just with like cable or something. Some people were killed by torture when they ask them that you torture the year and you get electricity until you die. Other people died from starvation. Like the Nazis, the Syrians apparently keep extensive records and coerce prisoners into performing key tasks. When anyone die, you take the body to the isolation room, you get a pen and the paper and you write them on the forehead. So the bodies was in the room more than seven, eight days, which means the body destroyed. So we was forced to uh, like, uh, so like take the, the legs there. So when I, when, when I take a body with just two arms, two legs, like bit of body and head, take it up. Three years of violence and malnutrition almost killed Al Shogre, and once he was dumped with other corpses for disposal. I just waked up, and I was like almost dying. I looked at the ceiling when I opened my eyes. It was like an arm over my head. I couldn't breathe. She just moved this arm. I tried to to take my me to the door and just started knocking the door. Someone opened and said, "What?" I said, I get a life, like second life. And he said, why? You should die. Hala al-Gawi's brother also disappeared into Sadnaya prison, and she flew from Turkey to Oslo in the hope that al Shogre might have some information. Unfortunately, I cannot be uh, hopeful. At the same time, I still have uh, a something tell me that maybe he's still alive. I feel justice is very important because no peace without justice. Legal experts believe the volume of evidence of war crimes and human rights abuses in Syria outstrips that available at Nuremberg, where Nazis were put on trial after the Second World War. So what are the chances of Syrian perpetrators facing justice? Russia and China blocked the International Criminal Court from dealing with Syria. So it's up to individual countries to act. There have been arrests of suspects in Germany and France. Austria has launched an investigation. And in Sweden, a lawsuit has been filed on behalf of the survivors of torture. After Norway came Washington and a briefing on Capitol Hill for senior members of the Foreign Affairs Committee who made promises of support. These people in prison deserve to survive. Assad cannot now deny his crimes, his crimes against humanity, and he will pay for those crimes. Load. This is how al Shogre looked when he was finally released. He thinks by mistake and was then subjected to a mock execution. Aim, shoot. Well, the last thing I heard. Somehow he managed to escape across the border to Turkey and followed the refugee trail to Greece, through Central Europe and eventually to Sweden where he's had death threats from Damascus. I'm the strong guy. I survived. You tried. You made me silent since three years in prison. And today you silent in this, silent in this picture. I am talking. I want this challenge. I want this war. I'm the survivor, I'm the winner. I love it. Such candor carries the risk of assassination, but Al Shogre says his liberty comes with an obligation to speak out. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Malcolm Brabant in Oslo.